All right, we can go live if you'd like, Lori, we're well, unless we're already there live. Well, welcome. Welcome to the Vermont House Transportation Committee. It is Wednesday, March 9th, 2022, 9 o'clock. We're going to hear testimony right off this morning that we've graciously asked Ross and John to come in and answer some questions around things that we debate within ourselves. And we need your we need your opinion on them because so, some of these are uh, questions that only you can answer. And then we'll then we'll see if we can make some decisions. But we uh, didn't want to move forward on on some of these without getting your input on them. And so I emailed I emailed Ross and I, I don't know if that went to John too. But here were the three questions, and then we'll we'll get started with that. So we wanted to know about zero fare and Green Mountain Transit. Because right now in the budget, there is rural coverage for fare free through 23, but the urban piece was not there. And the last we knew is that that was not something that Green Mountain Transit was looking forward, go, wanting to move forward with. But maybe things have changed. So before we make some decisions on whether we do that or not do that, we want to make sure we heard from you and your opinion on that. And then we had, um, as much as I really, really like the, you know, the, elect the electric buses, and I know that the agency has ordered 10, um, and that will be coming in in a couple of years, but there's a great desire in the world to have uh, our school buses electrified and assistance with electrifying the school bus area. And that typically has not been a part of the transportation T fund. It may be a part of the overall legislative body's desire to support, but just hasn't been through the T-Fund. And in the past, there was some VW settlement money that was helpful for ANR to work with school districts or whoever to get them. And so we wanna get your opinion on, on how we could maybe, uh, where in this building does uh, electric school buses come into play um, in, in that place? And then the third was micro transit. Everybody's, everybody's loving it. And we know that there are 12 new pilots beyond Montpelier. But the question that people had asked is about other areas that did not have public transit part of their structure or that how would they access an opportunity to have a micro transit? So those were the three areas. We've got an hour. Representative Shaw and I have a meeting at 10. So we're gonna, we, we will have a hard stop at that time. We'll take a break. And then afterwards, we're gonna hear some language, climate language uh, that, that we've seen once or twice. And, and now we're gonna kick that around with Becca guiding that one until lunch. All right. With that, Ross, would you like to go first? Sure. For the record. For the record, Ross McDonald uh, with the Agency of Transportation. I am the Public Transit Program Manager. And thank you for the heads up and the questions, Madam Chair. Very helpful to, uh, to help us prepare for this conversation and very much looking forward to it. There's always so much to cover and I'm always worried that you know, we're, we're not getting through the full conversation and uh, nuances that you know, make up all of our programs. But, um, as far as fare free, um, I did want to let uh, the committee know that I am part of a, a National Academy of Science uh, uh, plan to investigate a fare free analyses and studies with seven other states uh, to help guide uh, fare free impacts, assessments, benefits, and challenges that go along with those on a national scale for the FTA and for DOT. Um, so many places around the state, around the country, are considering fare free. We know uh, what, what transpired through COVID with contactless fare payment or zero fare services. And um, we are very much looking forward to seeing what uh, zero fares do on the rural side of things in Vermont over the long term as we build back our ridership, and, um, and look to uh, see what the new markets or new demands look like um, as we come out of this pandemic. 
But in terms of the urban system, I'm so glad that uh, John Moore, the general manager, is here uh, to talk uh, about their considerations and the process that led them, you know, to to this current uh, budget that that they have in front of their own board. So with that, I think um, it's probably best to turn it over to John. So we'll just go through the questions. John, for the record, please join us. Yeah. Good morning, John Moore, general manager at Green Mountain Transit. Um, and thank you, Ross. So um, for some quick background, uh, GMT does have a FY23 uh, board approved budget uh, that does assume uh, restarting a fair collection in our urban service area, which is uh, Chittenden County. Uh, that budget was based on our projected revenues, including uh, the spending down of the vast majority of our direct COVID relief funds. Uh, we've been uh, floating the fair revenue on the urban side for the the past two years with COVID relief funds. Uh, we will not have those available in FY23 to continue that. Having that said, um, I do wanna clearly state that uh, the GMT Board of Commissioners, uh, many of our community partners, our passengers uh, and GMT staff, including our frontline bus operators, uh, all strongly support uh, the language in the Transportation Innovation Bill. And if uh, fair replacement revenue could be provided to GMT, uh, we would be excited and thankful uh, to continue uh, zero fare service in FY23. Um, so we certainly support that, uh, that language. So John, let me ask you this. So it, it is, you know, consideration. There are many people here and, and outside and across Vermont that would love to see that continue. And it's been, which is why I asked you to hear, because I was a little bit torn as to, you know, if, whether or not you really wanted it, but we have an idea of what it would cost. Do you have a figure that, that you would find that you would need in order to make that happen? Sure. We have one. So, Thank you. so we do have uh, in our budget 1.6 million uh, uh, anticipated for urban fare revenue. Uh, just to note that budget was developed in uh, December and uh, we did our best to project uh, what the fair revenue would be based on uh, ridership. Obviously, that's been difficult to do with the pandemic. Um, I will say uh, in our urban system, while our commuter routes uh, have um, been the routes that have been the slowest to rebound in ridership, our core local routes are at uh, about 85% of uh, pre-pandemic uh, levels. Um, you know, our Williston route, which is our busiest, is at 90% of pre-pandemic levels. So, uh, that 1.6 may be at the lower end. Uh, we're hopeful that's a higher number because that would mean ridership comes back uh, more quickly. Uh, but 1.6 million is what we have budgeted uh, in FY23 for fair revenue. Okay. And I'll, I'll just quickly note that also uh, that number does include uh, the ADA fares. Um, so in Chittenden County, SSTA provides that service. Uh, that's a $3 fare uh, as allowed by the uh, Federal Transit Administration. Uh, so if we did continue fare free on the fixed route, that would include uh, our ADA complimentary uh, service as well. And that's what we did before, right? Or you did before? Correct. John, how does the um, rising gas prices affect that 1.6 million? I mean, it, it's, I mean, these gas prices are obviously going through the roof where, you know, it's anticipation that's gonna approach $5 if not surpass that. Um, you know, how much would that affect, you know, like you said, you did this budget in December. How does that affect that number? Well, historically, uh, high fuel prices have uh, increased transit ridership, and we have no reason to believe it will be any different this time. Um, you know, there is still the pandemic considerations, but as case counts uh, move in the right direction and folks start uh, heading back to the office, um, we do think that uh, the combination of uh, reliable service, uh, which potentially would be free to the consumer, in addition to uh, record high fuel prices, could uh, drive more folks uh, to GMT and increase ridership. Um, you know, studies have been done that show uh, the fare free piece specifically, you know, increases ridership um, primarily from existing users. Uh, but I don't think those studies uh, contemplated, you know, five or six dollars per gallon on fuel prices. So it may be a winning combination to uh, get people to try transit uh, potentially for the first time. Uh, and if it's free and convenient, uh, hopefully we can uh, keep them as uh, long-term passengers. So I think there could be some positive benefit uh, to that. 
Okay, thank, thank you. I was talking more about what you, your budget for you know the the diesel and, and the gas it oh. costs. <laughs> oh, it's hor it's horrible for our budget. Um, I can tell you yeah. that we paid about a dollar eighty per gallon uh, on average for FY twenty uh, one. Uh, we paid four dollars and forty cents uh, on our fuel delivery yesterday, which was over a dollar and twenty cents more than last week. Um, so uh, we will certainly uh, keep an eye on that. Um, uh, through January, we're, we're right on budget, but of course, the fuel uh, pressures really have started in the last couple of weeks. So uh, hopefully, that's a short-term uh, problem, but uh, that could uh, certainly impact our operating budget if it's an extended uh, increase in fuel prices. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I've got a uh, couple more hands up before we go. John, how many electric buses do you have running in that situation? So we currently have two two uh, full size electric buses in our uh, Burlington based fleet. And how many in your fleet? Total buses, uh, sixty eight in our urban fleet. Got a long way to go yet, right? Okay, yeah. gives me an idea. No, uh, I'll say the. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, but the electric vehicles certainly look more attractive when we're looking at uh, five or six gallon, uh, five or six dollars per gallon of diesel. Right, and I know the agency has purchased ten in the next block. I don't, yeah, they'll. Um, Ross can answer that, and I'm sorry, I'm taking every other representative's time. Go ahead, Ross. Yeah, real quick, I just wanted to confirm that we have received funding and are in the process of procuring or receiving eighteen uh, vehicles, uh, battery electric buses with charging infrastructure. It's not ten. What? We're looking forward in this latest uh, low and no bus emissions program, which uh, provides awards at 85% federal, 15% non-federal, uh, would be another seven of those large buses for GMT um, and uh, two or three buses for Marble Valley. That's where the 10 electric buses um, I think okay. may have uh, come up, which is that that's our planned ask in our next application, which will be submitted in the next uh, several weeks. Um, so uh, we have 18 um, on order and, and coming through the pipeline uh, with another 10 for this year uh, with uh, plans to uh, continue to ramp up and look at the market and the capacity specifications, miles and hours of operations uh, for our smaller cutaways. And once we have a viable option in that uh, uh, for that uh, class, uh, we might be able to, to proceed with you know more than uh, 10 to 20 uh, vehicles uh, on any given year in the future. Excellent. Representative Stebbins, sorry, thank you for letting me jump in there. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, good morning, Ross. Good morning, John. Thanks for coming in. Um, John, I just want to say uh, it was a, uh, a slow but rewarding process. I, I'm chair of Burlington Electric Commission, so I remember all the back and forth of the partnership to get those two e-buses. So thank you for that partnership. It's really been invaluable. And thank you also for um, you know, your support for this. When I speak with my constituents, um, when I talk to folks, uh, you know, there's, there's a bus stop about like four houses away from my house on Pine Street. And I'm like, hey, you know, how important has this been for you um, over the last few years in COVID? They've said it's been really important. Um, it, you know, it's just one, less uh, concerning um, investment that they have to like scrounge in their couch cushions for. So thank you. I also wanna, I just wanna say, I really uh, hope we can figure this out because I remember Ross, you had a 2019 report that said it would be helpful to like further investigate how to increase public ridership. And one of the things was zero fare, but that was 2019 and then we got COVID. So, um, you know, uh, continuing this along for a little bit longer so we can actually see what that impact is. Granted, now we have super high gas prices, so it may not be a perfect study, but uh, I think that would be really helpful. Um, and I also just think in terms of our climate action plan, uh, there are a lot of things in there that we, you know, we never, we never expected to do all the recommendations because things take time, but we can't do TCI. Um, we're not doing some other elements because we're not ready for it yet. And this is one of the things that was highlighted and it, it just, it means a lot for our most vulnerable. So thanks for coming in. I Appre appreciate that. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, kind of curious, these new electric buses that we're gonna be getting, how many batteries do they take? Um, 
Well, uh, the, the battery uh, packs vary, um, but um, they all operate as you know, one large battery of 5,000 pounds or more. Um, but John, if you have more information on that. Yeah, I'm not an expert on that. Um, the Proterra buses we have, um, I believe have two uh, battery cells um, on the buses and I think different uh, OEMs have different platforms, but um, it, it is a significant weight to the vehicles for sure. Well, thank you uh, for that. What do you do with a 5,000 pound battery when it's no good? Well, that's, that's a very good question. Um, for GMT, we lease the batteries. Uh, so at least for the 12 year life expectancy of the bus, uh, those are fully uh, warranted. Uh, in terms of uh, disposal, again, I'm not an expert. Uh, my understanding is that they will have some residual value um, at the end of the 12 years for uh, uh, storage capacity. They go somewhere to a landfill probably. Anecdotally, uh, and in uh, the literature I've seen, is uh, they're taking these large batteries and, and then applying them with other uh, reduced capacity batteries to power uh, uh, machinery and equipment that doesn't require so much uh, power as, as an electric bus and that doesn't need to move around to roads. And so um, some machine shops and, and the like um, are electrifying uh, and of course, the industry has a big challenge ahead of them if uh, we are going to be purchasing so many of these batteries requiring so much lithium and the like. Um, how are we going to look at those downstream uh, environmental impacts? Uh, but I do, uh, I am aware of some of those um, solutions or, or some of those next steps uh, of utilization of those batteries. One last question. Can we get is lithium available in, in this country or do we have to have it imported? At New Mexico, Arizona area, um, I believe uh, the Reno area um, have uh, lithium uh, main, uh, mining going on, but certainly uh, there's a bunch of rare earth materials that, that, that make up many of our electronics uh, that, that do require a international supply chain. All right, thank you, Ross. You're welcome, sir. Representative Shaw. For uh, John, John, you're, obviously your, your board would support uh, zero fare. Uh, it's, it's very advantageous to everybody. <laughs> but what happens uh, if you receive uh, request 1.6? But what happens if you receive something less? How would you would you reduce the fare? Would you use zero fare until the money ran out and then they'll go to collecting fares or have you even thought about it yet? Well, I think one option uh, would be to uh, uh, restart a fare on our commuter routes potentially. Um, so we operate multiple interregional uh, routes. Um, uh, so potentially if we had to uh, have some cost saving solutions, we would look at uh, potentially charging a fare on our commuter routes and keeping our uh, in-city uh, Chittenden County local routes fare free. Um, I don't know if we'd want to have a, a lower fare for a short period of time, uh, simply because there are a, uh, a significant amount of startup costs for when we uh, restart charging a fare, um, upwards of $100,000 when you look at training, uh, fare box parts, uh, uh, cash processing. So I think we would uh, probably try to uh, keep one segment of our routes fare free and then go back to a fare on another uh, segment uh, to the extent it made, it made sense. So you have an idea uh, how much uh, it would cost to just keep the uh, local fares uh, fare free and charge for your commuter routes? We are uh, looking into that today. I actually testified uh, to your colleagues at the Senate Transportation Committee yesterday uh, and that option was uh, suggested. Um, it is a little tricky because as I mentioned, our local routes are at about 85% of pre-pandemic ridership. Our commuter routes are about 35% of pre-pandemic ridership. So the dollar uh, amount will be much less. Um, you know, I'm thinking of the 1.6 and maybe, you know, a couple hundred thousand. So relatively insignificant, but uh, we are doing that analysis uh, today uh, based on your comment and then the comment we received yesterday from well, the Senate Transit. All I heard was 100,000. What, <laughs> can you say that again, please? So the commuter routes based on the current ridership um, status, if we were to go back to a fare uh, on those routes, 
Uh, it's going to be a relatively small amount based on that uh, total 1.6 million, um, but we are doing that analysis uh, today. And it's based on the, is it based on pre-pandemic or based on current use on that number? So our ridership projection was a based on a mix of, uh, of both, um, looking at uh, when we developed the projections, kind of the trajectory of the uh, ridership based on uh, the pandemic. Um, so it was looking at both current ridership, but some historical levels as well. Okay. And when, when do you think you'll have that number for us? Uh, we should have that today. Okay. You know, hoping you'll forward that to Lori. We will. Thank you. Thank you. So that's question number one. And I, I, I appreciate you coming in with this support and with the dynamics around, well, you know, our timing right now, we're going to try to do the, the, the will of what people can do and with the data and depending on where we can fit this in, because things are going to be, we're going to need to make some priorities around money crunching, particularly tomorrow after we at least see everything that's that we all want to think we want to be able to do and then we'll see what we can fit in the in the the uh in the budget um and it sounds like you're doing some analysis and like you said if you get that to us today great depending on where we are and what we can do i'm sure you'll have an opportunity over in the senate as well to make some modifications on that to to sharpen that pencil even even greater so if if you're okay committee let's move because we got a half an hour with them and then e-buses the e-school buses. We know about the e-buses for public transit, and and uh, or at least we're even hearing a little bit more. But talk to us about the 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 school buses piece because there's desire for that, and we're just trying to figure out how and where does that come into play. Sure, uh, we're also trying to uh, constantly figure out the best way to um, provide um, comprehensive mobility to uh, all of our citizens, including school kids, where it makes sense. And the rules are, uh, are very much bifurcated where transit um, cannot uh, provide uh, school transportation solely, but if it's part of a regular route, then it then falls into a, cat a category called tripper services. Um, and for example, uh, John and the urban system have several uh, routes that uh, largely accommodate school kids. And so um, we also have a few dozen routes that, that do serve uh, school kids along uh, their normal commuter routes as well. Um, but for us and, and working, we do not work with uh, school bus companies. But what we have done is through our MTI grants of which this uh, committee, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, set up for us, uh, we have provided uh, uh, money for the future of transportation group to work with school districts um, and to outfit them with uh, electric buses um, and uh, see if they can incorporate the school bus route into a public transit service, which is very much reverse from using public transit and trying to fit in to accommodate school bus. But this is a type of layering or, or, um, uh, or approach that could bring more capacity um, and more uh, mobility to the general public. So Jennifer uh, uh, Wallace Brodeur, uh, Brodeur Wallace, excuse me, at VEIC has been a, a, a leader in those discussions. And we've been part of uh, those, um, uh, those presentations, um, but uh, the agency doesn't have the relationships or programs, grants, contracts, with the school bus industry. I think we could work with you to get, to get the, uh, the right um, people in front of looking uh, at these types of um, uh, benefits, but um, school buses may be a, a good place at this juncture for some electric vehicles because they operate 174 days rather than 250 or, or, or more uh, for transit systems. And many times they don't run the miles per day that a, a transit vehicle needs to. Um, that being said, um, uh, you know, we just, when we saw that uh, question, uh, we were just kind of wondering like how best to try to um, coordinate, you know, that, that uh, effort to the right people. But we're, we're certainly not the right people to, uh, to speak on behalf of 
uh, school bus companies. Um, but um, as we electrify our own fleet, um, that is going to serve a level of schools. Um, and um, I'll, I'll see if John has anything else uh, to add to, to the question. It wasn't exactly, John, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, because that's, <laughs> but if you have anything to add, please go ahead. No, that's out of uh, GMT's wheelhouse as well. Yeah, yeah, that's what I, so um, we were wrestling with, we're, we're wrestling with not whether or not Vermont or that we don't see it as an issue around emissions, we're trying to wrestle with who, who's, who's working on that piece. And, 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 and where does it come out of, you know, AOE, I jokingly, some people came in yesterday from the, the uh, House Education Committee and I, I asked them how their, how their electrifying school bus conversation has been going in. <laughs> but um, so with that, your, your partnership on figuring out, is it like with through ANR, through admissions and, and how do we get them um, help to motivate on r the grants that are potentially available out there to get either school boards or communities or school bus companies, having them get that little bit of assistance that gets them moving in that direction. And we don't quite have an answer for that just yet, but we want to see that, that relationship shorn up. But yeah, um, I could see right, a lot I got people up. I'm just, yep. I uh, got Representative Stebbins and then Representative White. Thanks, sorry. You can go first if you no. want. Okay. Um, so for, we haven't really, we did a, like a high level skim of the TIA bill um, for committee members. Mm -hmm. And I just want to sort of explain what the language says. Um, because VTrans is so amazing at writing grants and because so many of our school districts are small, uh, and really, honestly, just still digging out of the challenges of COVID. Um, and, you know, so many schools are still being, dealing with mergers. The thinking behind this section is we have VTrans that is brilliant at writing grants. And we have a bunch of schools that um, could use some help from, you know, our expertise at VTrans to apply for like, there's $8 million in federal funds for e-buses. So the thinking is just to make sure that Vermont students, um, you know, and Vermont schools don't miss the bus. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Perfect. Okay, half on the board. So we don't miss the bus. I mean, this, this doesn't mean we're saying put $4 million into e-buses tomorrow, um, because we know that, again, that market is still transforming. It's really about making sure that we use some expertise. Yeah. So that's why it's not in agency of education right. or elsewhere. The other thing I just wanted to say, the reason why um, eBus is, this, besides the cost and yada, 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 is so important is because, and I'll quote this because it's pretty scary. Uh, for our kids' lungs, studies have found that diesel pollution can concentrate in study. School buses lead into even higher exposures for children who ride buses. It's diesel exhaust is considered a class one carcinogen. So, and uh, so, so if we can like not miss the bus and keep the ball rolling, yeah. um, using some of our expertise, it's, it's not, yes, it is staff time um, and it would require coordination with other agencies, but it's not necessarily um, saying put money into the infrastructure right now. Right, right, not here. So we wanna maximize our opportunity without like overwhelming. <clears throat> We need our grant writers working for the, the other buses as well, but I think we do have some expertise that we could willingly consult, have it as a consulting role with. Does somebody? Michelle. Oh, Michelle, please. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Bloomhauer, Vermont Agency of Transportation. Uh, I think the, the key thing here um, that I would put out for you is that our, our grant writers who are great at doing their job, Ross and his team, um, their salaries are paid with federal transit administration funds, mm -hmm. which would not allow us to, you know, do that activity. And if we were going to engage somebody to do it with non-federal funds, I would suggest mm -hmm. that we probably need to be looking at BEIC or some other expert agency who has these same skill sets and not be looking within an agency who has a mission that's outside of school buses. 
um, even if you gave the Agency of Education money, they could contract with the EIC and get the job done. But I, I would I would say that this would not be a good fit for us in terms of all the other important priorities you're having us look at and, and advance. Good. I've got Representative White and then Representative Burke. Thanks, Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. And actually to that point, Michelle, um, the language that uh, Representative Stebbins was speaking about is Section 9D of the Transportation Innovation Act initiatives that the group of five are really interested in seeing move. And we specifically call out, and I have a, I have a question, but I just want to say we do specifically call out BEIC within that language. And I have to be careful where I tread on that at this moment, but yes, you do um, because you work for them. Exactly. So, so disclosure folks. Yes. For those listening and those yes. in the room. Yep. And <laughs> I don't work on this program, obviously, but um, I do want to call out that that's a section we have within that language. And my question would be for Ross, um, do you feel that the, I don't know if you had a chance to review the language, but one of the key pieces is asking that there be an administer for uh, that AOT, the Agency of Education, ANR, um, that they administer the funds through creating a grant program similar to what we saw with the VW monies. So I'm wondering if you think that that is an appropriate ask of your staff to work collaboratively to continue um, the same program essentially that we were able to administer with the VW funds. Well, I certainly uh, defer to Michelle and, and her perspective on, on larger agency uh, um, capabilities and, and appropriateness of these types of things. I, what I can tell you is that VEIC generally writes our low and no emissions grants, and um, they, uh, they have been very instrumental in, in our um, success of five straight awards for uh, e-buses. They're the ones who go out and work with the a local uh, utility, um, the company that is seeking the vehicles, as well as developing the specs for the procurement of those uh, vehicles. So we would not uh, be close to uh, having uh, the, the current status that we have with our electrification uh, plan uh, without, without the critical support at VEIC. In terms of those other agencies um, and, and uh, the oversight, I don't know, as Michelle mentioned, and we've we've looked at that before of, of conducting uh, other transportation related activities that is off the books from FTA, which were funded by 100% FTA funds. So uh, uh, to put more pressure on our uh, non-federal funds would be something I, I think we're, we're trying to avoid. Okay, so I, I got a little confused there at the end. So the program that we're describing in here is to pull down federal funds to the clean it's not out yet it's my understanding is it's a formula amount of the carbon reduction program well, what is the low and no emissions grant program is, exists now but we also have the school bus money that will be coming down maybe that might be the competitive part and i apologize there's a lot of different federal avenues <laughs> So I think I, I need a little bit more understanding of that point, um, but I appreciate your response. Thank you. So it's Representative Burke, and then for clarification, what I heard was this much, <laughs> actually VEIC writes the grants for AOT's low and no admissions. So as much as we're giving you credit, which is very nice for you to make sure that we appropriately <laughs> credit the source of, of some of that because you have the where for all to actually work within contract with them to actually write the grant. There, there's your source potentially for um, either education or school bus companies to access through them as well. But these guys have- Okay, that makes, sense. that makes sense. All right, Representative Burke and then Representative, oh, I wrote Burke twice, <laughs> Representative Shaw. You're very good at this, Madam Chair. <laughs> you are. Yeah. Um, uh, to Gabrielle's point about the, the lung issue, I have occasion to work in schools sometimes, and I've been horrified, even though there is a law against idling, oh. that the school buses are outside waiting for the kids and they are idling. 
is you know the ones that I've seen. Um, another point, I wonder if it would make sense for us to see if we could have a chat with Jennifer Wallace to get some more information. So who's General? Who's Jennifer, General? she works for VE. She's been working on the, the Ross alluded to her. <laughs> And actually, a question for you, Ross. I know, I, I know you <laughs> made mention of that sort of program that the electric school bus public transit um, project. And is that moving along? Or I guess that's something we could also get from if we were to hear from Jennifer. Sure. And um, uh, to to be clear, uh, you know, we do participate in uh, in, in weekly. Calls. Uh, we provide the guidance. We provide our perspective. Uh, we we bring coordination uh, to that. But um, they provide the grant language to us, and then generally, uh, me and my staff are are putting the application together from from that uh, that copy. Um, just full disclosure: um, the low and no bus emissions uh, program um, has been a a, a big. Um, uh, there's been big increases associated with the IIJA, and there's uh, been uh, a five five time uh, level of investment over previous years for the low and no bus uh, emissions bus program. So um, that is moving forward. Uh, it was just announced on Friday the notice of funding opportunity. And uh, we've already uh, reached out to John um, at GMT and, and his staff in Marble Valley with VEIC uh, to conduct a kickoff call to uh, embark upon the application creation process. Um, and uh, we will uh, look forward to moving through that. Um, I, I'm confident if we were successful in, in previous years of receiving three or four vehicles, two, two to four vehicles per year, um, this year, ask, uh, requesting 10 as it, uh, um, as it relates to GMT and Marble Valley. Um, I like our, our chances there. Uh, the, the concern there will be uh, the delivery dates. And that's what we had discussed earlier, which is even though we'll be um, uh, applying for maybe a up to a $10 million grant um, uh, in the next few months, by the time it is awarded and we procure, we could be looking at delivery dates into FY24, very likely. Um, and so there's the, a timing uh, piece to this that has delayed um, our procurement. In the past, uh, our small buses have been delayed because of the lack of uh, reasonable specs to bring onto our services. Um, but right now, those larger buses can meet uh, upwards to 80% of our current routes in terms of hours and miles of operations. That's why this year we're focusing on the large buses for our larger facilities who can um, in incorporate these uh, more seamlessly um, as a smaller percentage of their fleets than um, uh, you know, uh, another entity that may rely on two or three of those buses alone. When we look at these uh, case studies, uh, we, um, we were able to apply and receive funds for two electric buses through the VW program and Marble Valley received those uh, just a few weeks ago. They prepped them and uh, they, they're out on the street with one in the garage with, with some mechanical non-battery electric uh, issues. So we have seen uh, some fits and starts with some of these case studies. And so, uh, First priority certainly is do no harm and sustain services with these vehicles. Uh, I, I think uh, the next year, uh, uh, next year's plan with the low no emissions bus program uh, will allow us to, to proceed um, and, and really ramp up when we have those uh, cutaway options. Thank you. And then Representative Shaw. Thank you. Uh, Ross, the report you gave us, um, well, when you were first in January, Talking about the uh, the grant program for e-buses, uh, you suggested that uh, the BW funds were going to be used for uh, probably the state match. Uh, so everybody used to be trying to use BW funds somewhere. Uh, what's your what's your plan for the match for the next group of buses coming in? Are we still in the BW funds, or have you run that dry yet, or? We may have run that one uh, dry uh, representative, uh, but for us, there should be enough 
uh, funds in the uh, FTA, low and no emissions bus program to meet our needs. There are uh, uh, match requirements along with the VW funds of which we uh, split um, with Marble Valley um, in, in Rutland uh, for those two buses. And moving forward, similarly, uh, we'll have to work with the local entities uh, to come up with the non-federal match. Usually our capital projects come in at 80-20, 80, 80 federal, 20% non-federal. Uh, these electric buses are 85-15, which certainly saves us 5% off the top. And what I'm trying to do is work with the locals to ensure that they can at least provide the same dollars that they would have provided otherwise if they were to buy an internal combustion engine, gas or diesel, if they were providing us forty to $50,000 for uh, one type of vehicle and they want an electric bus, we would still rely on that forty to 50000 but the state um, uh, budget would, would have to make up the difference. The reason being is uh, certainly our, our, our local funds, um, you know, may not, we may not have the capacity to, to raise our local funds by a, a level of 20, 30% to meet the increased uh, match needs um, as it relates to, to these capital investments. Um, but we plan to work on that 15% um, at either a, a 10% state, 5% local, or some calculation to, to make up that 15% non-federal match. We're beginning to see the bottom of the bucket on VW funds. I, I'd let ANR uh, speak on behalf of their VW program. We were happy to get the two uh, vehicles, and um, I think our, our needs can be met with with the FTA eighty five fifteen funds. Great, thank you. Great, uh, Representative Stebbins, and then I've got one final one, and we'll move on to the last question. Okay. Okay. So I just sometimes I just step into the stupid zone here. All right. Do we have to write? legislation that directs people to have a conversation together to work together or can we just say ross and and whoever i don't consider this in your billy with john you know when you're working with and you're meeting weekly with the veic um which is vermont energy investment, investment right just for those because we've got a big thing this is watch our acronyms um can we invite the bus companies and, and AOE to that conversation. Is there, how do, how do we, how would we ask them to the table, so to speak? Yeah, that, that's an interesting idea. And one that would uh, just expand what we're currently trying to do, which is on a quarterly basis. Uh, right now we have weekly calls with all of our providers uh, with VEIC and the utilities um, on specifications and, and charging infrastructure and rates and all of those things. Um, once a quarter, starting in May, uh, these will be opened up to uh, all of the public transit providers so that GMT can see what RCT is doing or what Bennington's doing and contribute um, to uh, their own processes, which are similar, but um, rather disparate in terms of uh, uh, procurement processes and setup. Uh, so to work through VEIC and invite um, other interested entities, um, a and or uh, school bus companies, um, certainly there'd be no harm in sharing our processes with them. Great. That's. I think this is where we want to go. We want to invite. We want them. We want to light. We want to light a little bit of a fire underneath their desire to move in that direction. And Gabrielle, Representative Stebbins, last question, then we'll move on to microtransit. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm sorry. Um, clearly, this is a, a, an area of interest for me, um, mostly because I hate riding in diesel school buses because they make me like have a headache. Ross, um, do you think that you guys do great quarterly, like you do a lot of great sharing. Do you think those quarterly meetings are enough to make sure um, that we won't miss out on potentially $8 million of federal funding? Because I'm, I'm fairly certain our school districts are not going to be able to pull it together. Do you think that's enough? I think it's enough to pique their interest, but nothing is going to replace the uh, uh, the full uh, consideration that comes with an application, with working with their local uh, utilities and uh, fitting up the, the charging infrastructure, which will be specific to their own uh, fleet needs and, 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 and school routes. Um, but this would show them uh, kind of what it takes and what are those 
suite or parameters of considerations uh, that they would need to address. There's a way forward um, and, uh, and it just takes a little bit of time and effort, but um, that could be helpful, but, we, but it will not be inclusive and, and allow folks to just go ahead and receive the funds and, and move forward. Um, that's, that's unlikely, but what it would do is, is inform them of, uh, of their own range of considerations. So we could miss out. Or they could miss out. Yeah. 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 If they're not there. For but, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So that's about as clear as sort of mud at the moment still. But what we do know is that there's the most important thing I'm walking away is VEIC is actually the grant writer for many of these things. And how do we have a conversation with the others to get them get them aware of this stuff? So we'll continue to have that and try to figure that out because it's the desire and it's part of the cap, the, the climate action plan to see this electrification. Okay. And I, I personally just started with, with the T fund dollars where, where, that, where that line is, where we help others move without, it's not our, not our circle. Um, can, can we move to microtransit or did you have- I just got a very easy question for okay. each one of these gentlemen. Uh, can you tell me these buses are going to be driven in the winter and they're going to be hauling school kids. Are they going to freeze in these buses or the heating systems work well under 20 below weather? Or? Yeah, thank you. Uh, to be determined, uh, we have experience with our Proterra vehicles and, and John's fleet uh, that are outfitted with diesel uh, heaters on, on top of the bus. Uh, so that you don't draw down the battery to such a uh, extent. Um, they have had issues with those, uh, those heaters. Um, I've been part of discussions where new manufacturers and new approaches uh, uh, for those, uh, you know, to, to heat the cabin is being addressed. And that could be um, better insulation of the cabin itself, um, uh, the, um, the air exchange uh, um, uh, approach, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, maybe offset some of the uh, uh, burden on those heaters. Uh, but uh, heating the vehicle is, is, a, is a complication and a challenge. And I uh, would turn that to see if, you know, maybe John has something else to, to add to keeping the buses warm. something about Eagle heaters on top of the buses. What are those? It's a, it's a diesel uh, fired uh, uh, space heater that uh, works to heat the cabin that is separate from the battery. Um, so uh, they can maintain, um, you know, the reduced miles and hours that cold weather, um, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, results uh, in with the vehicle. But you did say diesel fired, didn't you, Ross? Diesel, propane, some people yeah. are talking about hydrogen, uh, the, the cold uh, hot air uh, exchange pumps, those things are all being considered. No, even the old gas buses, uh, kids freeze in them. Right. So I'm just a little concerned about, you know, uh, a first grader or a second grader not being able to get to school because the bus won't heat up over 30 degrees or 25 degrees. So there are issues with that, then I take it. Some Sometimes I think that it's almost better when you can buy just like eight buses at a time because the technology is going to change in five years from now it'll be again so different so sometimes i don't want to buy a hundred buses and now now we're obsolete so if we're, we're you know if you re remember like the first e, e cars could get like 30 miles 50 miles and you know now we're so it seems like every iteration and every year it just gets you know they work on those problems but it's good that there's a backup it's good to know as we get questions about it the you know that they've got a backup system if they need it because it's not it's not always cold in Vermont just sometimes feels like it and um, there's a lot of the time when it's when it's not that cold but it's good to know that we've got that that option or they have that option and I move on to micro chances because we've got Representative Sean I've got a meeting at ten and so we're going to need to scoot where wherever we are in that conversation and we're going to leave you. Representative, in charge. Wow. 
<laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, a, just in case you want to run for the door right now. So, <laughs> microtransit, sir. Microtransit. Um, okay, there's a lot to cover here, um, and I'll do my best. Uh, microtransit, we have the one pilot in Montpelier. GMT is running that. It's called My Ride. It is um, successful, um, and I would call it uh, largely successful, but it isn't the slam dunk that is shown. Um, such an efficient service with a reduced um, per mile cost with every user saying this is a far uh, improvement over what we had. As a matter of fact, about 40% of those trips are along the old Montpelier Hospital Hill route. Um, so uh, that's what we're learning with the current case study on the ground. Um, and uh, I've heard you know, so many good things about it. Uh, maybe that caused or created a little bit of a irrational exuberance on my part to talk about how it's going to transform uh, uh, rural transit. But uh, what we've done is move forward and we have funded 12 feasibility studies, not 12 pilots, Madam Chair. Okay. And I want to be oh. clear that what we're looking at is, is 12 communities uh, that have or don't have transit services now. And what would it look like to incorporate microtransit to switch the fixed route service into a microtransit service or to bring a vehicle or two into an area that has no um, fixed route services. So those are broad three categories that we're looking at through these feasibility studies. What we're trying to do is try to assess um, uh, the, the, the costs, the ridership benefits, uh, the abilities to provide our demand response services, Medicaid, as well as uh, our elderly and persons with disability program. Um, do we improve uh, those uh, trips and, and uh, the costs of those trips through microtransit? And we're learning a lot. Um, in those uh, 12 uh, feasibility studies, we are hoping to uh, finish with at least six of those um, before the end of next month so that the providers could include the costs and their microtransit plans in their applications for FY23. The, that will show um, what the true cost projection is going to be and what it would mean in those communities. And uh, we are working with VIA, uh, who is overwhelmingly the, the leader in microtransit in the country and have over you say that name again, sir? I'm sorry, I missed it. Sure, VIA, V-I-A. And they are the software provider for the MyRide service. And they use the VIA service. And uh, GMT uh, uh, incorporates that software into their vehicles with their drivers. Um, and uh, they are the one, and they have a planning shop uh, with some really great modeling uh, um, uh, uh, features and functions. And what we're finding is in areas, for example, Bennington, they have three routes serving uh, Bennington. Uh, they're well used. Uh, there are some, uh, uh, um, some lack of ridership in between the areas that they're moving back and forth. And VIA says, you know what? The fixed route service in Bennington is pretty efficient. Um, and for the costs to uh, replicate microtransit service with 15 minute wait times, you may be looking at, you know, doubling the cost to provide not too much more efficient service. And so uh, GMCN said, well, what about Manchester? And they go, well, Manchester, that's different. That's more dense. It doesn't have transit service. It's got some uh, feeder services in with new services serving Stratton. And so now they've pivoted to look at another community. That's just in the one example of the of the six that I've been part of that are showing that microtransit may not be the, the slam dunk that we thought it may be in terms of a better way to provide services um, uh, uh, rather than fixed route in, in some of our towns. We'll get through more and more communities. And as we do that, we'll be able to post those against other communities. Uh, 3,000 people with this much uh, transit service with, with this type of demographic uh, makeup, um, and then make uh, better determinations on how does microtransit best fit in Vermont. Um, so we can talk about all of those, and I, I really look forward to, to, to doing that. So for us, the plan is uh, to award three or more 
uh, pilots for microtransit in FY23 that represent um, maybe the disparate uh, range of uh, communities that we're trying to serve. And then to get our second year of the MyRide pilot under our belt with some tweaks and changes there uh, to arrive at uh, uh, you know, maybe a worksheet that would show um, the, the considerations and calculations that would uh, uh, result in more microtransit investment. Microtransit's on-demand service. And in addition to the uh, microtransit on-demand service, we do have the Medicaid service, our elderly and persons with disability program. This year in FY23, we're including recovery and job access trips. So those are demand response services that we continue to try to expand. And Madam Chair, the uh, question said, you know, not every town has transit service. And that's very true in terms of fixed routes. Um, but every town in the state is um, part of our demand response services. And every town is getting uh, medical rides and essential services on a 24 to 48 hour reservation basis. Um, so I did want to uh, make sure that the committee was aware that transit does touch all of our uh, communities and serve all of our communities. Microtransit um, is one uh, way to improve demand response. Another way may be with a, a group like Capstone, and we're trying to work on a scope there that would uh, allow them to use their own electric vehicles to become part of the fleet options that GMT would have as they try to expand demand response in central Vermont. And so we have Medicaid, uh, demand response, uh, elderly and disabled, recovering job access, and then could there be that last line for everybody else who falls out of eligibility, single moms trying to get a kid to uh, healthcare or somebody broke their leg and can't drive for two weeks, whatever that may be. And that would be able to assess what are the true essential services that we're missing uh, and the demographics that we're missing. So we're working on the demand response front in many ways um, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to, to work on those and, and bring the results to this committee. Right, I'm, we're going to need to leave, or at least Representative Shaw and myself, and I just want to thank you for this and coming in on short notice on our last week here of trying to dial it in, because there's a great deal of, of desire to have more opportunity with this. We want to make sure how we want to partner with you on how do we make that happen for more people and um, in a way that makes sense. Okay, and, and I think... Representative Corcoran, you're in charge, and last known was Representative White's got her hand up. And let me know whatever happens. All right, go for it. All right, go for it. <laughs> thank All you, Mr. Chair. Sure. And thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Um, uh, thank you, Ross. Uh, so I have a few questions, but the first one I'll start with um, is I'm not sure if you had a chance to review the Transportation Innovation Act uh, initiative language that we're hoping to see in the T-bill be incorporated. Um, one of the key components that we identified as the group of five was that we want to see microtransit expanded throughout the state. And we had difficulty trying to identify the best way to do that, frankly, uh, because it isn't to it, it, it's not totally clear how the agency is funding them into the future other than the, and even with that, the FDA funds. So I, I appreciate that you took some time offline to help me understand that and um, that you're here today. So my question is, you have the 12 feasibility studies. You have, it sounds like three that you believe that you can fund moving forward to FY23. Why not try to fund all 12? You know, I really should be saying to the extent possible, um, Representative White, and um, uh, what we're looking at are applications coming in next week that are going to try to uh, project gas costs, the increased driver wages and, uh, and labor overheads associated with the service. Um, and uh, when we look at our budget, uh, we could see uh, maybe an increase of 20% or more just to maintain the current services that are on the road. As a result, before we start investing in, in more options, and I also have been speaking with 
uh, uh, GMT and Capstone to inject some more funds into their program for that particular pilot, an expansion of demand response uh, services in central Vermont. Um, but uh, when I say three or, or so, some of these feasibility studies may come come out without a recommendation uh, for microtransit and may um, not include microtransit um, as an outcome. And um, until we see what uh, those applications come through, it's it's just been difficult to uh, to commit to more of these services. Um, but um, if we can fund four or five um, or six, uh, we will do so. And um, I, I need to see what those feasibility studies look like. I need to speak with these providers and um, see what their level of interest is. And if this is truly a priority for them in their region, I think it will be. And um, all I've seen are a lot of uh, interested uh, 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 staff members being part of uh, uh, you know comprehensive discussions. Um, but um, that's kind of where we are. And I think at this time next year, we may be in a far better position to state, um, this is what microtransit can do in these locations. Um, this is the most uh, advantageous community type that could uh, move toward microtransit. But um, as, as I mentioned, um, we're, we're, well, microtransit, uh, what we're seeing could be not two or three buses running around a particular uh, uh, region or uh, on three routes, but it could be four or five buses serving uh, uh, an expanded region. That could double um, our operating costs uh, just for that particular community. We've got some additional funds to apply, no question, and really looking to use those uh, additional funds for more different and better uh, transit and mobility services, microtransit being uh, a primary consideration. But um, until we see what those are going to cost us, what that means, we may be uh, best served by continuing to expand our current dial-a-ride demand response services through our E&D program, elderly and persons with disability, to keep looking at those line items of, of needs, whether it's elderly and persons with disability for essential shopping and medical uh, appointments to recovery, um, uh, uh, counseling and, and, and rides that uh, um, Medicaid wouldn't otherwise cover or that they can't get to, and then job access, a big piece of you know, getting people uh, gainful employment and, op and an opportunity to seek better uh, options. Um, and then again, this capstone program, four or five electric vehicles added to the capacity in central Vermont would allow that, oh, you don't, we don't have uh, funds or a program for all of those items I just mentioned. This is now part of a community rides uh, bucket of, of money that I would like to make available. So then we could really not only determine who we're denying, but determine who we can serve um, if the funds were there. Who are we missing in, in our demand response dial ride services? So concurrent to the microtransit comprehensive 50 minute wait times for a vehicle to come through, that's unlikely to be able to be rolled out in 200 communities around the, st the state. It could be a very good fit or a, 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 a really nice quality of life uh, part of smart growth and, and those types of uh, uh, land use development plans. It's the demand response and dial ride services that we need to continue to expand out, regain our volunteer network of whom we've lost 50%, which really kept the per, the per trip costs down. We've got a lot of work to do uh, for, for this non-traditional, non-fixed route mobility services. Microtransit's one of them. The rest is uh, demand response and working with agencies, maybe like Capstone. I'm very curious to see what that's gonna look like. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ross. That was informative and also added a layer of complexity that I was not aware of because you mentioned the community rides bucket of money. So I, I wanna understand that more. But my, my question to you is, I really appreciate what you're saying around not yet feeling like you have enough information to move forward with all of the feasibility program, the, the 
what the studies that you've done so far and waiting to hear information. What concerns me is if you aren't even budgeting to have that be a pool of funds available, then you have already decided that you're not moving forward with any more of those feasibility studies beyond the three that you're describing to us. So it feels like the decision has already been made in the budget. And I just want to understand if I'm misunderstanding that or if there's a pool of funding, maybe it's this community rides bucket you're describing that would open up for these other programs. Because I think from my perspective, when I hear from the rural part of my district in West Hartford, microtransit and the ability to have that service is where they see us moving as a state. So I'd really love to see how we can best implement more of this in all of the locations that you've identified with feasibility studies and do more of them, frankly. Absolutely. And, and, uh, yeah, I'm sorry if I, uh, I'm communicating something that uh, it, it doesn't align with what Michelle and I speak about all the time, which is how do we build out microtransit um, as best we can. 12 feasibility studies uh, is uh, quite a bit uh, for us. It spends about all of our planning uh, funds uh, for this uh, up to this point. We're using some old planning funds, some new funds. We'll have planning funds in our FY23 budget. Um, to conduct more uh, uh, feasibility studies. The MTI grant has been used for a few of those. So uh, when you mention MTI uh, uh, funds being used uh, in part for feasibility studies, absolutely for our uh, transit providers to identify two or three more communities every year that they would like to consider um, as we all learn, it's like the battery electric, just new technology, new ways of delivering service um, uh, with, uh, without risking, you know, uh, the, the baseline reliable service that we have in place. Now I expect to do, um, feasibility studies far more, uh, in the future than just these 12 that we've identified initially, we could be doing, you know, 10 to 20 of those a, a year. But, um, if we're seeing uh, results, like we're seeing in, in Montpelier, which is uh, a little bit uptick in, in ridership, um, kind of re re reverting back to maybe one of the routes of the Montpelier Hospital Hill that would be fed by the MyRide uh, uh, software. Um, it's making me a little bit more reticent or uh, less confident that microtransit is going to be the, the most efficient uh, uh, way uh, to provide um, essential mobility services. We're talking with Windsor and, and Springfield now um, in terms of you know, the, uh, a microtransit pilot. And they're like, well, what if we have one vehicle in each of the locations? What if we have three? And we have none right now. Every vehicle uh, that's, on, that's in operation throughout the day is going to cost about $200,000 a, a year. Um, and uh, we need to look at those ridership uh, uh, projections and, and the return on investment on those. So I think these feasibility studies will really lead to really uh, good pilots, which will really then, uh, um, you know, kind of reveal uh, the value of microtransit in Vermont. Okay, thank, thank you, Ross. I yeah, think no, I sir. understand the point. No, yes. sir, I, um, we've got a couple questions lined up, um, Ross, um, Representative Stebbins, Representative McCoy, and Representative Burke. <laughs> Uh, oh, sure. Sure. Can I just clarify sure. if it would be okay? Um, I think one of the questions that you were asking, yeah. Representative White, was um, do we have money in the budget to implement yes. the pilots that are finishing their feasibility Thank study? God. Yes. And so that happens in two ways. So if we're doing it like we did for my rides in Montpelier, we are basically taking your existing fixed roof service mm -hmm. and um, instead of spending the money on that, we are spending the money on the micro transit. So we already have that built into the budget. And then in terms of um, the new feasibilities, some of those are in areas where we already have transit operating. So Ross mentioned the grant applications that'll come from the providers soon. They will be building in their anticipated costs for micro transit instead of potentially um, their fixed route service. And so we already are anticipating the need to fund. We also, in all the existing service areas and when 
we have data that indicates a new service area is right for coming on, which is what these feasibility yeah. studies do. We then can access um, new start funding to, um, to try out a new route or to bring on a new service. And that's where this piloting of the microtransit is really important because it's such a new, and then we do the same thing for fixed route bus service. If, if we fund a bus service for three years and find that it's not performing in the manner we thought it would, then we would likely take it offline. That's typically our sort of framework. And so I hope that adds a little yeah. context. I think it's just, it's a very thick bush that I'm trying to like weed my way through because yeah. what I feel like is being communicated to me is that you are not funding all the feasibility studies and I'm not understanding why that is, but you also have the full breadth of funding to do that is what I'm hearing. So like you have the ability to do it, but you are choosing not to, or it's yeah. that you don't have an answer to if they are actually things you should be funding. Is that more? <laughs> so I, I think Ross can clarify, but through the MTI grant yes. program, we have adequate funding to so far have provided uh, the ability for a community to do a feasibility study if they were interested. Okay. So it's not as though we're getting more demand than we have resources available. But the second half of that is once you finish the feasibility study, it's going to reveal whether or not this looks like a viable option. Yes. And then so far we have um, been planning for and have had in the case of Montpelier, the resources to move those forward into a pilot to see if they're gonna work. So right now there's no shortage of funding to advance feasibility studies and then viable pilots um, in our system. Is that correct, Ross? I just wanna make sure I didn't misspeak. You know, thank you so much, Michelle, for the added context. You're exactly right. And, and there are feasibility studies to see if that service is gonna be feasible um, and what that ridership and return on investment would be. Um, and those early conversations that we're having um, are, are revealing a little bit more uh, nuance and, um, uh, and more challenges and more costs than, than I probably anticipated before we started the process. And this is, this is why we're doing the feasibility studies. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are we done with the Thank you, Chair Corcoran. <laughs> oh. um, continuing along this line, one of the things I've heard from folks in the Montpelier area is that part of why there have been some hiccups is because there wasn't enough startup funding. And Ross, to what you were just saying, um, that you've, you know, you're learning through the pilot process uh, where additional funding might be needed or whatnot. So first, uh, I really applaud the fact that you're like really identifying where things really are needed. I mean, if, if we need it in Bennington, uh, great. Um, it's, you know. It's for Bennington. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> no, I mean, if Bennington is already getting our services. So you're going to get a train. <laughs> you're yeah. going to get a train. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess, I just, I guess I'm just concerned because there, what I'm hearing from folks who like are using the Montpelier system, even uh, Kurt McCormick yesterday, or Kurt McCormick yesterday wanted to take the ride up to the hospital, uh, couldn't get through. Um, so I guess I just want to make sure that the reason why some of these might not, the reason why some of these hit issues isn't a result of funding. Like if we're going to go for something, we got to make sure we have enough in there. And, and that's one piece. My other question, um, so that's, do you really think you have enough? So that's the one. And yes, I'm going to make you repeat it again. Sorry. And then the other question is, um, I just, I, I'm, I'm so glad I, that you keep mentioning, you know, the Medicaid, the elder person recovery and job access. Um, I just, I, and it's always so hard to get a message out there, but I'm just curious whether, like, how we can get the message out more and more and more to Vermonters that these are available. Because for the folks that are really hard hit, I don't think they're like, going on their computer or their, you know, iPhone to look things up because they know to look things up. So just wondering if you can reiterate, like, is this at libraries? Is this at town halls? Like, how do we, you know, how do we really get the message out that VTrans is there as support? So those two questions. Okay. 
Um, in terms of the MyRide pilot, uh, the data that I'm seeing are people are waiting between 10 and 12 minutes for the bus on average, and that they're on the bus uh, for about 10 minutes on average. Those are all uh, um, preferable uh, to hour long headways with maybe being on a bus for 45 minutes to get to the other end of the circulator, which is right over there. Um, so uh, those are positive and it tells me that the vehicles that we have out there most of the time are, are, are able to provide that type of service. Um, you know, I don't have, uh, and I have heard at the end of the day, uh, there's been issues with uh, the buses being full and people saying, well, there's no service available. So John's expanded the hours on, on the, uh, of the uh, operator instead of the hours of operation so they can clean up uh, those trips, uh, you know, after uh, the the the, the, op the the normal operations would uh, occur, um, and so those are things that we're learning. Uh, we are looking to uh, provide as as much funds as GMT needs. I'll say that we were spending about seven hundred seventy thousand dollars in transit service, including uh, the demand response service in Montpelier. And we're around 950, and uh, so we've added a couple hundred thousand dollars plus uh, for the my ride service, and uh, continue to, to to learn from that. Um, I don't know when we look at uh, these feasibility discussions that we're having. I'm not hearing a lot of people saying, "Oh, well, you have two buses running around Middlebury now. You'll only need two more buses, uh, two buses for micro transit." Uh, it could be, "Well, let's keep this." Uh, fixed route in place and then add two or three buses and that changes the, the full consideration. I was hoping that um, a, a move from an in-town circulator like, Mont, uh, like Montpelier or Middlebury uh, would, would uh, cost a, 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 a another $200,000 or so. That could be wildly off uh, depending on some of these scenarios that we receive. That is why, you know, we're just um, reluctant to say yes, all of these 12 communities um, are doing feasibility studies uh, and will be receiving microtransit services. There's going to be a lot to consider there. But uh, moving forward, we're going to learn about you know, which where it makes sense and we'll be able to fund three, four, uh, uh, you know, to the extent possible, uh, microtransit services around the state to try to figure out um, how best these different approaches uh, for these different communities work. Um, we, uh, you know, that sounds you know, kind of uh, reasonable as we learn more uh, about microtransit and, um, and that's kind of where, where we are trying to be uh, prudent and, um, and also working with the providers to ensure that they've got the drivers. If we're gonna add two or three uh, buses, uh, that means two or three drivers. And of course we have a driver shortage. And so we have to, we have to uh, talk about that in addition to the other costs that I, I, I identified earlier. Um, so on the messaging, uh, there are several ways to um, bring uh, the domain response dial or ride services uh, to people who need them. Generally speaking, it's through client-based services, uh, uh, the assisted living, uh, the uh, uh, agencies uh, uh, on aging, um, uh, the independent living uh, and disability community, VABVI. Uh, these are all partners that we have throughout the state, and they many times contribute uh, a 20% non-federal match for those trip costs. So now those, and those are being done through uh, regional, uh, what we call E&D committees or elderly and persons with disability uh, committees. We're trying to work with our providers to expand those E&D committees to mobility committees and bring in more people, whether they're town managers or the people who are working in recovery houses or um, counseling um, to see again, what mobility, needs are, are out there that are not being addressed. And um, certainly we can use the Go Vermont site um, and services and web to uh, promote um, uh, these uh, dial -a ride services. Uh, but um, overall, um, even DMV has uh, a flyer where people are, when they're told you, know, you, you weren't able to renew your license, 
here's some options for you as you're maybe aging out of driving or, or the like. Um, so that's those are uh, examples of how we uh, disseminate the information and um, and serve uh, those clients. Thank you. That's it. Uh, Representative McCoy. So thank you. So um, you have 12 feasibility studies in 12 communities. Uh, my question is, have all 12 feasibility studies been complete? And if they haven't, then you have um, you have said that you're planning on um, three or more pilots in FY23. My assumption would be that you've gotten at least three feasibility studies back that you think will work. And additionally, I heard you speak about the Montpelier um, My Ride and that the old hospital fix route is getting 40% of the service. So seems like a melding of both a fixed route service as well as a micro transit service, demand service may be um, more amenable to some communities, especially in a Montpelier city type and maybe a more rural area would be, you know, same thing. If I'm going, you know, but I don't know. Might maybe micro transit works better in rural. I don't know. So. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, none are complete, um, and out of the uh, twelve that we've identified, six are due to be complete for the six providers who are looking to provide micro transit. They've identified two communities each, and they said, "Hey, this is the one we need." for our application period. And so VIA said, we can't do all 12 before August or April, um, but we can do six. Um, and I'm part of those discussions on a weekly basis. And at least three of those will show a way forward. Um, and, uh, uh, and so that's why at this point, we're anticipating investing in microtransit to, uh, to the extent possible. Uh, for those uh, uh, communities where the feasibility study shows um, uh, an increase in efficiency or a significant increase in ridership and, and mobility access. So um, those are you know, kind of the midstream decision-making uh, um, uh, considerations that we get to share with the committee. Uh, but um, at this time, I don't have uh, completed feasibility studies, just tons of conversations around the state. Um, in terms of uh, Montpelier Hospital Hill, the hybrid approach, uh, that's, that's what we're seeing in, in Barrie, maybe uh, uh, keeping the Barrie uh, 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 route that, that connects Montpelier and Barrie with two microtransit services on either side, with Capstone coming online, with uh, uh, improved demand response services out in our hinterlands, feeding in to these areas that have essential services. Um, may may be uh, you know among the approaches that we look at when we see a small town um, that uh, um, has very little uh, service or no service, maybe micro transit twice a week, Mondays and Wednesdays for the community is to be considered. So many nuances and, and scenarios to consider. And uh, what we'd like to do is is put our best foot forward in FY23 and try to cover as many approaches as possible to see if, if one approach uh, seems uh, like a better bang for our buck than, than others. And in those areas with a few hundred people that are 20 miles away from essential services, that's that expansion of the traditional dial -a ride services that may be able to provide more essential services for more people um, that won't include micro transit just because by the time we pick up one or two people and get them from uh, Peachum to St. Johnsbury, uh, you know, that person's going to be waiting an hour just for, you know, for one trip. And that's going to be, um, you know, probably not feasible. So those are the, the nuances that we're um, trying to wade through uh, with these, these six that we expect to be done in the next month. And then the other six that we expect to be done by July, August. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Representative Burr is going to close it out. Okay. Um, Ross, this has been really instructive, and I really appreciate the com complexity and the way you've been thinking about this. And 
you know, in terms of not just like, okay, yeah, let's do this and this without, you know, really, really thinking hard about what's the best way to proceed. So I just really appreciate your work. Uh, I just want to ask, or just get sort of, I think that I know that not all uh, your MTI funds go to microtransit and for other, you know, to old folks home or other things like that. So I'm wondering if, if you had more money in that program, could you use it? Might not be able to use it for microtransit, but would there be a need, needs out there that are unfilled right now that if we were to add more money to that, or can you use the carbon reduction funds money? Uh, just trying to get a handle on like where the money is and where it could be used. The MTI program seems to be working as designed, which is testing um, uh, transportation demand management approaches. Uh, and we've been able to fund uh, nine out of 10 applications that have come to us to, to, to an extent. Um, and uh, those who are showing promise, we've been able to, uh, uh, to uh, extend another year and provide additional funding, like the Montpelier um, uh, Sustainability Coalition, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition or SMC, who are doing a lot of the outreach for the microtransit pilot. Um, right now, uh, we're not seeing a, a big need for additional funds. I did notice in the language that there was a, a language specific for microtransit feasibility studies. Um, and we can certainly look to do more through the MTI program. We can um, also um, uh, uh, understand that uh, a feasibility study is about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars, and there would be no need to to put a hundred thousand dollar cap on those. Um, but um, also, um, when we look at the analyses and and the carbon reductions of these steps, not every one of these projects um, will uh, necessarily be justified to keep moving forward. So that'll free up more funds for more of these types of feasibility studies. Um, if that is indeed what our, our providers would like us to do or the communities that we're serving would, would like us to consider. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that's going to go for questions. Um, thank you very much, Ross and John, for joining us here today and uh, providing us with um, your, uh, your testimony. Uh, very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Thank day. you. Take care. So I think we